Well, World War One on the Western Front, anyway, is your, your classic example of a war of attrition, isn't mm. it? Just your classic example of it. Um, yeah. Terrible, terrible thing. Yes, yeah, the most um, hideous thing you could imagine. Yeah, actually. yeah. This is this is another reason why I was just like, you know what? I'd rather the big set piece battles give me an Agincourt. You know, like, you know, this this there's something heroic about that. There's nothing heroic about this. This is just, it's just the industrial murder of men. Yeah, it's the exact opposite, really, of, of yeah. heroism. Yeah. Um, There's yeah. no no one man's action matters. You know, yeah. you're just going to get killed. The hell where youth and laughter go. Yeah. Um, so I remember seeing said. a picture of a, a Russian guy from World War One, uh, where you like literally a picture of him in 1914, and then a picture of him in like 1919, and he looks like he's aged 30 years. Like, it's just harrowing. It's like God. And a thousand yard stare. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, the. the, the just wide eyes and just the 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 like you know he's obviously like 15 16 or something and then he's only like 20 when he comes back but like the 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 wrinkles and the the the, the sort of depth of his eyes and it's just like you can see the weight of it on his face it's like oh my god yeah like this is just awful because it's also a lot of what a lot of veterans say from all sorts of wars it's not just that you see horrors hmm. it's not just that you might have to shovel up the remains of your friends or whatever it's that you personally did terrible things yeah like you killed other people you stabbed them this close closer than we are right now um you know um there's one one example where a guy it, it was a german actually um it might have been actually ernst Jünger, is a very very famous hmm. um account of world war one um where he was helping one of his own friends who'd got wounded and as he's helping him a, a gas shell goes off nearby and the his own friend uh, who had a wounded arm was putting uh, his gas mask on with his other arm and Ernst Jünger says well I just turned into an animal just ripped it out of his hand put it on myself and had to watch him gurgle and die God. see uh, this, this you know this, things like that this is what I mean about the difference between like the industrial warfare of the 20th century and pre-modern warfare like you don't get reports like that actually from like you know ancient or you know medieval i mean you get a few i guess but like, you know when the crusaders arrive at jerusalem and stuff like that but you it's not reported in that way by the people who went through it you know they they actively sought out war you know they wanted to go to war because it wasn't just oh by the way now you're about to die and five seconds ago you were totally fine because you know there was no random gas canister that arrives anything you know when you when the when the day of battle happens you okay you're both lined up it's predictable you know they're moving towards you they're firing arrows you put up your ship, whatever it is you know now you've got to you know have a, a fight with a bunch of guys in hand okay fine at least it's you know why it's happening you know you can see okay no they're coming at us now right we've got to you know the, so so there's this sort of not a sense of, I mean, agency is one way of putting it, but like there's a sense of at least understandability about what's happening. But like if you're there, all right, I'm helping my guy, and then a gas canister arrives, oh God, you know, it's there's a sort of weird insecurity that modern warfare, I think, and because like, okay, I'm going to go up over this trench, boom, bullet kills you. So, you know, <laughs> like what, you know, that was, it, you know, the, there's a sort of profound insecurity. And I, I think it was Dan Cullen again who was describing it, uh, like in a, like in a in an ancient war, like you are actually in danger very little amount of the time. You know, it was only on a very few occasions where you were in actual real mortal danger. And then, okay, it was very dangerous for a, a you know a couple of hours on a day. And then afterwards, there's a long period of no danger at all, basically. You know, whereas in like the industrial warfare, it's just not like that at all, and it's horrible. Mm. Like it's this like weird sort of gaslighting. You know, of the individual soldier that seems to go on. Yeah, it's it's quite literally dehumanising. Well, yeah. Um, it's it's especially if you're at, on the front line. No, yeah. You've been circled to the front line, so you might have to spend hours and hours and hours, sometimes days, under bombardment. Mm. So you're fearing for your life at every moment. Yeah. For hours, for hour after hour, sometimes day after day, you think any moment. Mm. Um, and people were rightly particularly terrified of artillery fire mm. um, because a bullet usually make a nice neat hole in you. Yeah. But artillery shreds you. Yeah. It shreds men. Yeah. It's terrible. Um, Some of the reports I recall reading from like one of the battles in Belgium where 
like there are just men in craters screaming and it's just mud and blood and rain and explosions and it's just i mean if you wanted to describe a hell on earth that's what it would look like you know again just it's everything's out of your control you know and there's nothing you can do you know okay in an ancient battle you lose them i'm gonna run away <laughs> and throw down my shield and run away you know okay you might get away you've got in fact you've got high likelihood you know we've, we actually sort of you know know the sort of survival rates of greek battles you know the, the, where you hop like phalanxes a really high survival rate for both sides actually you know so it's like it's, and then you've just got the world war one's you know muddy craters but there's like, again i think i'm sure it was dan Kalamon, but like where he, he, there's a guy in a crater who's lost both his legs and he's just screaming and they have to just listen to him screaming. And it's just like, they can't go over and help him because they'll die. And it's like, God, what an awful bloody, you know. Or you share the that shell hole with him. You're in there with him. Yeah. Like quite often people get trapped in a massive shell hole and they can't, uh, they can't get out. They can't poke their head over. Yeah. They'll instantly be killed. And so they're stuck in this giant shell crater for, again, maybe days. Yeah. And the shell crater is half filled with water. Yeah. That water is poison water because gas yeah. has come over. And it's poison gas quite often in World War I wasn't, it was obviously gaseous, yeah. but it was much more than that. It was quite viscous. It would right. stick to things and you'd have like a film of poison over everything. And so the water is poisoned yeah. and there's loads of dead bodies floating in it. Yeah. And there's men in there for days. So there's also piss and shit in it. Yeah. Um, and your buddies, uh, their guts are hanging out and they're screaming. It's... <laughs> To you describe couldn't... it as like a hell is not an exaggeration. Right? Yeah, I mean, what would hell be like if it wasn't this bad? Like, how would it be worse? Like, literally, you know, everything around you is poisonous and disgusting, and every you're you're probably in pain. You've got no food. You've got no water. You can't leave, or you're going to die. And everyone else around you is screaming or dead. And like, another shell might come over. At yeah, any moment yeah, you could well. die at any moment. So you're constantly in fear of death. So, like, what would hell be if not that? You know. No wonder you see sh shell shocked guys that are quite literally just in, c can't stop shaking. Yeah. It's been days or weeks since they were at the front and their mind is absolutely broken. Yeah. Like, no wonder. Yeah. Especially if you were raised in the late 19th century, very early 20th yeah. century, which was quite. Totally um, old world, yeah, basically. Yeah. And, you weren't and, expecting this. You and again, like, it. I have to, I, I, I know I keep drawing the distinction, but you just don't get this kind of report from the ancient world. You know, even mm. in the most dramatic defeats, like after Cannae, the Romans were like, okay, that, that was terrible. We're going to raise another army. You know, we're going to go back into the field. They, you know, it, you didn't hear reports of, you know, Roman soldiers who were unable to fight afterwards. You know, the, you know, the, like the, the, the people who managed to escape were sent to Sicily, right, to serve in Sicily. They were still serving, you know, it was, because again, it's like there's, there's, there's this weird element to the war that is just evil and, it does terrible things to the men involved, you know? It's no holes barred. It's gloves off. You're trying to sucker punch the other side whenever you can. It, it, there's it, no holes barred, you know? Yeah, but it's, it's it's not even that. Like, okay, fair enough. Like, I, I think it's the unpredictability of it all, you know? The fact that you're just in this constant state of tension because at any moment you might die and everything around you is hell. Mm. You know, it just wasn't like that previously. Yeah. You know? Yeah, right, yeah. Not on that scale, not for that amount of time. Nowhere near. No. You're absolutely right. Um. Well, one thing to mention then is that in February 1917, where I mentioned these salients mm. and the lion gets bulged out mm. and that might not necessarily be good for you, all yeah. sorts of things. In February 1917, the German high command, Hindenburg really, um, decides he's going to deliberately shorten his line. So it's a massive retreat over a fair few miles, over dozens and dozens of miles, mm. retreat back to a, a line of defence which they'd already put in place where there's a natural ridge line. So they did that. So the Germans... Um, so they take men away from that defensive position and put them somewhere else. Yeah, or just draw them back so that mm. their whole lot, so to make the salient straight. Yeah. So you need fewer men to defend mm. that line. Um, so that's sort of quite a grand thing to mention because they keep fighting over the same bits of ground. Yeah. Um, Hence the black adder joke of, you know, this is the land we've taken. So like, well, what's the scale? One to one. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 For example, in the Battle of the Somme, you could count for every foot of ground that was taken it cost thousands of guys yeah. per foot it's just not um, worth it, <laughs> yeah. not worth it. <laughs> obviously well, one thing just to mention real quick which everyone i'm sure will know mm. is that it's nearly always much much more costly in blood to be on the offensive obviously um, so and the germans really find this out mm. to their chagrin in 1918 
To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.